You should be the host here. I'm really laughing at you. We're both monster people, diehard monster people, and we want them to do well. The Red 78 with Alan Quinlan and Neve Briggs. Nobody knows monster rugby better. I'd like to think I know a lot. Hello and welcome along. Uh, I'm Alan Quinlan and you're listening to the Red 78 here on the Rugby Channel. And w- with me as always is uh, Neve Briggs after a... Probably not the best weekend, Neve, for you. We're not going to talk about Spurs because... Uh, I don't think they were even weekends. playing. It was an international yeah. weekend, but um, yeah. disappointment for for the Ireland women's team against Wales. You were beaten twenty seven nineteen, and on Saturday, so much optimism and excitement. Uh, but the word we probably a lot has been used in 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 by various different people is patience, new era. Give it a little bit of time. That's probably not much consolation to you and and your team. You wanted to win. It was the first home game and you wanted to get off to a start. Um, yeah. After looking back and processing it now, what does it feel like? Yeah, look, you're obviously disappointed that you didn't win. But I think for us, we can take a huge amount of positives from it. We played some super rugby, and especially in the first half, I think. Um, but more importantly than that, we probably learned a huge amount. I think we learned that we've got to try and... Um, Going on to possession a bit more, like our work rate was off the charts. Nice three percent tackle rate. Like, um, need Jones to twenty three on her own, like crazy stats. But on the back of that, the reason why we had such big tackle rate or why we had to tackle so much is because we afforded Wales a huge amount of possession. So, um, but still a huge amount of positives. Uh, two new caps and a lot of big game experience for for a lot of girls who were capped previously with Ireland, but probably wouldn't have played in front of a crowd. And like that crowd in the RDS the other day was unbelievable. So um look, we are disappointed with the result, but I don't think we're we're a million miles away from from the Wales time of Scotland, Italy tier of the Six Nations. And I just think that you're right. We've got to be patient and um we've just got to keep <clears throat> improving you've got to see developments and improvements in every single game and I think if we do that at the end of the six nations we'll be in so much so much better place come this time next year if that makes sense and the positives that you have are, are, are we're there to see I was at the game um, and in fairness the ambition was really good if you were looking at it uh, from a coach's point of view and looking at the negatives um, the possession probably was one that stands out for me um, the penalty count and Maybe a, a little bit at the end, just being a bit shrewder in the game management. Because obviously, I think you're playing a side that are very physical. Um, their impact off the bench was 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 pretty important for them. And they were a heavier, bigger side as well. So for you looking at it, loads of positives. And we, 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 we will give the credit where the credit's due. But if you're looking at the negatives, where do you need to get better? And you're talking about the learnings because... You're, it's 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 a harsh business as well, isn't it? And you want results. So where do you need to get better? Yeah, look, we definitely need to get better on that penalty count. 14 to 5 obviously isn't um, a good uh, number. Was that pressure, Neve, or was it... And look, I was probably an expert on this, giving away penalties. Is it just playing on the edge? Is it making better decisions? Are some, you know, you'll always have a few penalties that you're a little bit unlucky. Is it a mixture of all of them? Yeah, definitely. I also think we probably just got a bit naive in terms of trying to contest the breakdown when we knew the ref wasn't hot on it. So we, you know, we probably shouldn't have put ourselves into that position. And I think um, when you're under a huge amount of pressure for long periods of the game, like lots of that goes out the window because you're just trying to get the the opposition down. And um, so yeah, look, I definitely think penalty count. We've got to be smarter than that. We've got to learn to figure out very quickly what the refs are, are blowing and what they're not blowing on. And um, so that's one. And then obviously two, you know, game management, but you're looking at a very young nine and 10 there um, and a young 12 to, to be fair, I think. So, um, but the big thing is, is that you, you put it out there to them and they come back and they say, do you know what, this is how we should have exited it better. We should have backed ourselves here more. We should have looked to do this. And, and they're coming up with the answers. So they know the information. It's just, you've got to try and get them to do it in the cold face. And that's the real difficult thing. And you know that, like when you're playing that intensity um, and you're trying, your brain is trying to work, you're trying to get your body to move, you're trying to organize things around you. It's definitely a shock to a few of them, I think. Um, 
And I just think that they'll be the better for it. Um, and ex- more... exper- experience is something that, that makes a difference when you're in those yeah. kind of situations. Um, talking about, um, you know, when, when you, you're talking about the interpretation of the referee, um, getting a good balance of when to counter up, when to, in the tackle reload, when to go to breakdown, or else fill the defensive side. Um, I, thought, and I, I thought the application and the aggression in the tackle was, I was incredibly impressed. Yeah. You know, it was um, some massive tackles. Um, your back row, um, Dorothy Wall, Adel McMahon, Brittany Hogan, just the tackles yeah. they were putting in. You know, Sam Monaghan as well and, and Nicola Friday. All, all of them. Um, yeah. They were incredible. Um, just the tackles yeah, they I were think... putting in and, and the effort and the intensity that they were bringing. Like, you could see that they really wanted it. But it is a case of, of if you were being critical and, and you know if you're standing in front of them and you are a coach I'm not telling you what to do but you want to get better and they need to learn these things and and probably um, experience brings that because to be fair to them Niamh, they are relatively inexperienced not just at international level but some of the girls probably even just playing rugby in the last number of years yeah, probably. I think, you know, definitely a, a good group of them don't play 15s week in, week out, but they have had a chunk of 15 since the the Christmas break, which has been brilliant for us. And we've seen a huge um, positive in terms of they when they came into the first camp, their ability to, to play rugby and to be able to go for long minutes was huge on the back of those six weeks of, 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 of matches, which was great. And so, yeah, look, I think the big thing is, is that it's, 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 it's not going to be as quick as people want simply because, you know, we don't have a, we haven't had a huge amount of time together. So you're thinking about three weekends of camps where you're delving into things that you can definitely control. So obviously your attack shape, your defense policy. And after that, you're trying not, you can't really overload them with a huge amount of information. So you're just kind of working on core skill breaks. And if you can get, continue to, to get better at those core skill breaks and add another layer to each of your attack and defense every week, and are these players working in college jobs? Yeah, but a chunk of them are, are working. Some, uh, obviously, some are in college and then some are contracts to the sevens. So um, there's a huge mix. And I tell you what, Quinny, I've been involved in Irish squad since 2009, 2010. And um, it's probably one of the most enjoyable groups to be around. Like, they're great crack and they're really bought into it. And what I love about it is that the young, younger girls. So when I went into camp, are you probably the same? You're going in and you're full of fear. You don't want to make a mistake and you're very quiet and you're, you know, you're sitting in the corner. They, these ones are not. They're literally living their best lives and it's brilliant. They have a huge amount of energy. And so I think if you can couple that culture with an improving on-field development, then you know we're going to be in a good place. It's just that it's not going to be a quick fix. Do you think if you had more time with them, because you 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 you're chatting to in the last few weeks, you kind of had three weekends, three camps in the lead up to this. Now the players were playing games, which he did want, and um, yeah, Brandon Williams and you as coaches, you wanted them playing games, but you're not traveling to France until tomorrow. Wednesday to play at the weekend that's it's it's a tough ask as well to kind of guess you're not meeting up till tomorrow to train and 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 get together again that's difficult when you're playing against a team who are full-time and like what you experience against Wales at the weekend 12 full-time players 12 part-time contracts it's a bit yeah. of an uneven playing field France, France are kind of similar to us though they don't have a huge amount of full-time players and um, it's but they they have full-time club players, so their club are the ones that um, pay them as opposed to the, the union. Um, and they're but, still full-time, whether whoever Well, as in, them. some of them are, yeah, but as in, like, it's not that they're, like, Linda's playing over there with Claremont, and I've had a really good chat with her about it. And Yeah, look, I think, clearly, look, we're not professional yet. I think that's definitely going to come down the road, but we've got to be able to maximise the time, and you know, I see the, the Limerick girls here the last couple of days. We arrived home on Sunday. They're literally in the recovery mode. They conditioned last night. They went to the pool. So they're professional and everything else. It's just like the fact that they're, they, they're, they're not in name. And um, for us as a group, we've decided it's, it's not really an excuse for us to talk about other play, other countries and, and what they're doing. We've just got to concentrate on ourselves. And um, so we went to camp tomorrow morning, 100% great. And then we'll train a couple of times, like in terms of like do development and install. And Thursday morning, we'll train again and then we'll fly to Toulouse on Thursday afternoon. Captain's run Friday and play Saturday. Look, it's 
it's fast and it's furious, but um, it's good. It's you a know? lot to pack into a few days. And look, I think your policy of, of not focusing on, on the other countries that, that have different situations is a good one. It's probably for people outside to talk about that. I think it's a little bit on uneven playing field, but um, what happened at the weekend, I think there was a lot of, a lot of positives. And particularly, I was genuinely, and I mean this, I'm not just saying it, I was um, really, really couldn't believe the the the, the skill set and the attack um, and the improvement in the attack. There was mistakes and there is nothing, you know, the power probably the well, she struggled with that a little. And that's something you're just going to have to manoeuvre and work around and try and get better at. Um, a few lost line outs, um, but so many positives. And I just thought the effort out of the, out of the, the players was was fantastic. I'm just good. We're just going to finish up because obviously we got to move on to uh, Monster Benetton and Monster Leinster this week. But the try from from Linda, the offload, my God! If if the the men's team did that, it would be down for try of the season. Um, it was phenomenal. I think there was a, an offload from Adele McMahon first um, in the build up to it, and then Sam Monahan's offload to to Linda Dujang. Am I saying her name right? Giving her Dujang, yeah, Dujang. Yeah. Two yeah. gang, she was it was just a phenomenal try. Yeah, yeah, um, no, it is. And, and and irrelevant of whether it's men or women's rugby, I'm pretty sure that would be up there for one of the tries of the season. Um sure. I thought I thought we we'd held it for about nine phases. We went from edge to edge, and then yeah, look, Sam Monaghan, like her abilities, like I just think that I don't even think we've seen the best of her yet, which is really scary because she, you know she's just a brilliant, brilliant player and I, you could see it through too as well on another edge where she just literally sunny build it over uh, the Welsh winger's head into Linda's hands and it gives us another attacking platform. But they're all capable of that. And Greg's really big into that and their ability to be able to, we want to be, you know, over a period of time to be that best passing team in the world, but also have the ability to play what's in front of us and like that try epitomise it. Okay, well, look, you have a big task ahead of you at the weekend and... Uh disappointment but you've got to move forward if uh, games come ticking fast you play France this weekend then you have a weekend off and it's no Italy. straight in, no straight into Italy it's straight into Italy at home yeah. okay a bit more pressure you know when you lose a home game but um, look hopefully uh, as I said you can get some results for the rest of the tournament um, okay we're going to move on to to um, to the Munster Benetton game and just look back at the weekend Munster won that game uh Fifty. What was the score? We're on. I have to get it up here now. Fifty-one twenty-two was it? Yeah. Um, on Friday night. Um, strange game. We ha- I put out a t- uh, um, message yesterday. Just what do people? What do people? Monster fans think of the performance? Uh, not many kind of focusing too much on the performance. Really, kind of looking forward to. To what's what's on th- this week, which is it's a different that's, week. You probably indi- hear that, that word. That's, that's indicative week. of what's coming this week. I'd say the, the, the different week, different week. That's all what, I've heard. What's a build up? What's it? What's it? What's a Leinster build up? We'll talk like? about that in a minute. We'll do the tweets first, okay, sorry. and then we'll we'll talk about Bennett, and we're going to look ahead to the Leinster game and see uh, how how we dissect that and see if a monster a chance to beat him. Uh, Mick O'Brien responded. They did okay, Quinny. Nice to see the young young guys playing. They need a big 80 minutes full on next Saturday as Leinster, the best side in the competition. So that was um, the first response. And then this was from Keen McGibney. Um, I think they can win this one, Alan. It will be an interesting team selection from both sides, given Europe is on the following week. I think if Munster are to stay in the hunt for the home quarter final. They need to beat Leinster this weekend. Well, we'll talk about the table in a minute. Um, Michael De Burka, Michael Tiny De Burka, uh, bonus point win, but not very convincing. This was on the Benetton performance. I can see our pack. I can see our pack standing up to theirs, which is Leinster. Our scrum has been under pressure for the last two games, and I can't see it improving. Mm, that's a bit of a kind of a critical one there but look Leinster have been superb and it's it's going to be a huge challenge for them Jared Wallace um this has this to was be my match. this was my favorite tweet okay this has to be a match where we send the players out to try and win 
rather than try not to lose, which has been a feature of matches versus Leinster under Johan van Graan. Ambition, precision and intensity. So why is that your favourite? Because uh, I, I feel You agree like, with it? Yeah, a I little feel bit. Like the start, yeah, 100%. I felt like in the last couple of games, bar the Rainbow Cup last year, we, against Leinster, we've not had that real ambition to go and have, have a crack at it. Um, I felt like we were happy enough to kick it back to them and allow them to to probably play that kind of territory pressure type game. Whereas the rugby that's popping up, albeit not consistently for 80 minutes, but in patches, since probably, since really that Connacht game for me after Christmas has been really good in terms of that ability to run square, the offload, the ability to have um, people attacking together in numbers. And I'd love to see them. And if they go and they do that and they lose, I'd be like, that's, you know what I mean? I'd take that. But I, I really just don't want them to see go, you know, to watch them see kick the letter off the ball and chase down Leinster bodies. I, I just don't think that's Munster's DNA. I think it has happened a few times, certainly in the last couple of years, um, particularly if you go back to um, uh, probably the the first games after the initial COVID break mm. in, and that were on in the Aviva. I think um, Leinster beat Munster 27 25. And I remember Munster. You know, Leinster are a very, very, very good side and they're, they're going to score and they're, yeah. going to, they're going to put you under massive pressure. You need a lot of things to go right. But I think in that game, Munster were very ambitious and missed the conversion, I think, to level the game. A um, couple of weeks later, they played the league semi-final. Leinster beat Munster 13-3. And I thought I did think that happened in the game where there was a lot of trying to contain Leinster and, and probably kicked a little bit much. It's very, very difficult and there is an argument to say that if you play too much against Leinster, particularly deep in your own half, that you're going to be under massive pressure. Quinny, I'm not saying about playing in your own half. No, no, I know. I'm just, just saying that they, once they get to that halfway line, and even you'll often look at Leinster when Johnny Sexton's playing, the best place to attack is probably around that 22, your own 22 to 10 metre line, because the back three have literally all moved back to the back pitch, especially with the... 50-22 rule because they're they're expecting kicks, which means it's space in the front line. You're asking maybe 12, 12 players cover a huge amount of space. You just love to go and see them have a crack it up. Yeah, well, we'll we, we, we'll dissect that more in a minute. Um, As Tiernan Mull, uh, he says, need to put in a uh, need to put the performances up a few gears from what we've seen mostly this season to have a chance. Hope we take the game to them rather than and damage control game plan we seem to play against them in recent times. So that's another similar similar message there. Um, it is probably, um, yeah, it's something that we'll talk about a little bit more, but it's probably a feeling that's out there. Um, Ian Moore, uh, a lot depends on both selections. With two full-strength teams and the Thomond Park crowd, it might be a one-score game with 10 minutes to go, then who knows, but or otherwise Leinster strong favourites. So I think um, Paul Maher is another one, yes, but they will need to play at their absolute best and snuffle Leinster out as quickly as possible. So there's a kind of a common theme there. Yeah. Nobody really wants to talk about what happened on Friday night against Benetton. It's all looking ahead to Leinster. But let's go back and, and, and have a chat. Um, it, was, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't their best performance, particularly in that first half. I think um, it was scrappy. Um, a lot of mistakes, no real kind of cutting edge, really. Um, I think Matt Gallagher got a very good try, in fairness, with a little inside pass. And Craig Casey's try came from a box kick that kind of bounced everywhere. John Had Hodnett catches it, gives it to Zebo. He passes inside to Craig Casey. Um, and that's their second try. Benetton scored just before halftime, 17-10 at halftime. Probably not the mo most cohesive, sparkling half of rugby for Munster, particularly in, at home and in Cork. Um, I know the Cork people are pretty excited. They haven't had a Munster game there for a while. And, and um, when I played with Munster, we, we loved going to, to, to Musgrave Park and playing matches there as well on Friday nights. But it wasn't the best performance. What, what did you make of it, Neve? Yeah, but I also think you got to look at they came off a plane on Sunday morning from two weeks, tough weeks in South Africa. So they obviously Correct. couldn't really 
train probably properly until maybe the Wednesday with a whole group. And then you're only looking at maybe trying to nail down detail because um, the game is Friday. So I think there was always going to be that little bit of inaccuracy. I think that there was going to be that little bit of lack of cohesion, I think. And, and we uh, should say Jean Klein pulled out before the game as well. Yeah. So Gavin Coombs goes into the second one. That kind of seemed to disrupt the, the kind of balance to that forward pack. Yeah, scrum but I, was scrum was creaking a little bit as well, and I think they found their mojo, and I think that's 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 the most important thing. I think it was always going to take time for them to to get back up to the pitch of of that game. If that makes any sense. I think it was going to be hard to talk. You're talking about new combinations again, obviously, because the lads, you know, you're talking about minutes and and flight time from South Africa. Michaeli picked up a knock, and you're just thinking, you know. We've just got to try and get through this game injury free, as opposed to to, to to really looking at the performance. And um, I have to say, like I love watching the Irish twenties games, and it was great part. Love what like they the core people just come out, don't they, hugely and um and support because there was another brilliant crowd there again the other night, and they got treated to some some really good second half tries, I think. And um, so yeah, look, I think I think it was scrappy. Of course, it was, but. It was, I think it was a good a good win, and you couldn't really ask for much more. It was six, six tries in total, so they scored four tries in the second half. You, you, I, I'm just being being the devil's advocate here, presenting some of the negative things. It the negative, not the best performance, could be a good thing going into Leinster because you don't want your a really brilliant performance. Sometimes you can fall into a trap that things are not are, are perfect and then come unstuck. So to win fifty one. 22 at home, score six tries, get a bonus point when it, it didn't come to the 65th minute against a very competitive side who still were missing some of their internationals for sure, but still they're they're abrasive, they're tough. Um, and you know, I suppose there is lots of positives there. I think if I look at some of the stats, 31 kicks from hand leave against uh Benetton at home. It's a high number, isn't it? Yeah, it is, but is that indicative of the fact that you know Ben Hahn had a lot of possession in the Munster half, Munster man? I I felt like that Munster were still always in control of that game. If that makes they any were, sense. Yeah. And look, what you said about the the trip to South Africa, absolutely, loads of mitigating factors there. Um, number of players, you know, would have probably played the three games, played the two in South Africa, started and and then started again on mm. Friday night with that short turnaround and travel and all that kind of stuff. So. Of course, there's loads of mitigation. But I think if you kick the ball 31 times against Leinster, unless you get some early scores and you're you're managing the game, you know, the weather mightn't be the best on Saturday night. But I just think it's 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 a lot of kicks, um, 15 turnovers conceded. So there was mistakes and, and some things went wrong there. Um, I think the the two, the the Callum Braley try at the end, again, self-defense yeah. because Gibson Park or or uh, Luke McGrath, whoever plays for Leinster, would certainly test them around. Yeah, I think fringes. that was that was definitely a case of game's over, we're all switched off, and we're winning by a huge amount of points. I think that's a 25-27 scoreline against Leinster, that's not going in, do you know, kind of way. So um, it's human nature. You, you're, at, you're after scoring a try, you're just 80 minutes almost on the clock, you're, they're kicking off to you and you're just like, oh, well, just get me through this next phase and then we can get off the pitch. Yeah, just uh, standout players. Unfortunately, Simon Zebo picked up a heavy knock. Yeah, that was nasty. That. He and fell the, back and he's, the Benetton player as well. He uh, he, he, he picked up a heavy knock and uh, he's the, we're not sure if he'll be involved this week. Um, obviously, he goes through the HIA protocols. John Klein pulled out before the game with... Uh, leg strain, I think he was getting a scan on that, which is a concern, I think, because you could certainly do with his physicality and physical presence against Leinster. I'll tell um, you what, though, when he, if he can't make it, I think Jason Jenkins is an ample physical uh, replacement. That guy is absolutely huge. Um, but, yeah, I do, he literally got caught carrying real high. I don't know if you remember this. And he gets the ball gets ripped out. And then the next break, he literally just puts like his hand in, just so big. Just like takes the ball out. Just it's like as if it's like a a baby in his hand. It looks so small compared to he's just huge. And I think, look, I know Munster fans are really disappointed that he didn't, you know, 
get to play the season until last weekend, I think, and I'd no doubt, he's incredibly disappointed. And obviously he's going to Leinster. But he could be a really integral part. And I heard I heard somebody say or saw it somewhere online that Munster shouldn't pick him now that he's leaving Leinster. Oh, no. He's only played two games. Look, he hasn't chosen to be injured. I think he's been yeah. he's been very unlucky. Um and from a business point of view, it's a poor return on, on, on investing in a player, but you can legislate for injuries. No. And I know as much as, as, as anyone, you can just get some unfortunate yeah. runs with injuries. But I certainly thought when he came on at the weekend, his physical presence, even his scrummaging, um, and he may, may play a really important role um, against his future team on Saturday night and possibly in the running um, against, you know, Munster, an incredibly, as of all the problems, it's a really, 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 really busy run. Um, would you pick him on Saturday night? Uh, I, I do think that if um, Klein isn't available, I would, yeah, absolutely. Because I think uh, Fenin is, his work rate is off charts. He's having a really, really good season. And I think that because Gavin Coombs, is so explosive on the ball, like he was last weekend, obviously. And um, we kind of tend not to talk too much about Fenin. And I think he's having an unbelievable season for him. You know, his minutes on the pitch have been incredible. So I think he has to play. And then obviously, if Kynes fit, then you could look at him and having an impact of Jenkins off the bench. Or, you know, Tyke Byrne is back too. Um, But yeah, look, I just think that... um, I'm for sheer size, going you have to have him involved in a match day squad. Anyway. Yeah, I agree. I think if um, might be some consolation if uh, he can, he can. Um, I think he's the biggest he man I've ever seen. I actually think he's the biggest bigger, man. Big, bigger than RG Snyman. Well, it's just that his shoulders seem to be way broader. I yeah. I, I saw him down UL training a couple weeks ago, and I remember just looking <laughs> looking up at him, and I was like. It'll be hard to watch him in a Leinster jersey next year, probably flying around the place, having a brilliant I know, season. I know, after and this I, think year, he's, I think he's a diamond. I think he's diamond at a rough time. I think he actually could be class. Yeah, and look, as I said, people get unlucky with injuries. Nothing you can do. And um, it's, it's you know, we want to see Thomas Ahern come through and, and Finney Witchery, and these guys get more game time. And hopefully, RG Snyman will be back for Munster, and he can be doing the business for Munster next year. But uh, just on the table, so it was uh, Ulster obviously lost in South Africa, which kind of opens the door a tiny little bit for Munster and Glasgow and Edinburgh, who are behind, to possibly get into that top two. Leinster were obviously very impressive in their win against Connacht in Galway. So Leinster on 55, Ulster on 50, Munster on 47, Glasgow on 45, Edinburgh on 43. I think it's those five that are challenging for the top two. Look, it's fair to say that um, it'll be highly likely that Leinster will finish in the in 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 the top uh, at the top. Um, although- Quinny, uh, Quinny, that whatever about this weekend, that fixture in Raven Hill on the April twenty second in Kingspan. Sorry, away to Ulster could be really important for Munster. It is, yeah, it is absolutely. Look, Leinster, Leinster have got to go to Tom and Park, then they've got to go play Europe two back-to-back, then go to South Africa. So they have a difficult, very difficult run as well. But the probability is, look, because of their squad depth, that they'll manoeuvre their way through this. Even if they lose a game or two, they'll still probably have enough to finish top. They have five-point cushion there. But I think Ulster losing at the weekend kind of opened the door to the possibility of the chasing three behind, which are Munster, Glasgow and Edinburgh, getting into the top two. And the significance of being in the top two means you've got a home quarter final, you win that, you have a home semi final, which is really significant. It also brings in a, um, the revenue for that as well. So it's really important and massively um, beneficial to whatever club. I think if if Ulster don't make the top two uh, by a point or two, it, it just say that happens. I think what happened them in the, at the weekend in, in South Africa will. Uh, Will will be a huge disappointment. Callum Reid was scoring a try with yeah. a minute and a half to go. Uh, big debate. It's not our our place to be talking about it, but I thought the refereeing and the TMO uh, conversation was shocking, and it should have been a try, and it shouldn't be happening. But they came out yesterday, didn't they? And yeah, and but like it needs to be tidied right. up, you know. Which is no consolation. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's 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 it needs to be better, and yeah. um, it's no consolation. But it has opened the door up for for. 
for the three behind. So that table is really important. So um, we'll just finally, last bit of this segment, we'll move on to, um, you know, what's what should be a humdinger in store on, on, on Saturday night. My earphones are after falling out there. Um, what should be a humdinger on Saturday night. So I want to put this to you, and I don't want to be negative about this, but I want to deal in reality. That wouldn't it's, be like you at all. Come on. No, I want Munster to win, of course, and I want them to, to, to win, and I've always wanted them to win. And I know I keep saying that. I keep trying to justify my existence uh, working in the media. I want Munster to do well, but we have to deal in reality and probably deal with the frustration sometimes as well. The last time Munster beat Leinster um, in the league was at home in, on the 29th of December 2018, which is four and a half years ago. They beat uh, Leinster 26-17. Then... Leinster won the next one, two, three, four, five, six in a row. Now, there's two league semi-finals and a league final there. Um, the league final last year was the most consecutive losses for Munster in the history of this fixture. Obviously, from Leinster, the most consecutive wins. Leinster did go on then, or Munster did go on and beat Leinster in the Rainbow Cup. The reality is it was a completely changed Leinster team. Um, they had they had the Champions Cup the week after, and they put out um, a very strong second string team. And Munster played well that day and beat them. Okay, I'm not taking that away from. Them, but Leinster have had the had the dominant domino effect in this fixture for for a number of years now. And we keep saying it every time: Is this the one that Munster can turn it around? How much they need to turn it around and get a result and actually. You know, I'd love to see a full Leinster team because I think the mix and match of Leinster, um, I'd love to see a full Leinster team and a full Munster team on Saturday night in Thoman Park. I think it'd be great for the fans. It'd be great for this fixture. And can Munster do it? What do they have to do to win this game? What What do they need to get right on Saturday night? You're the coach. You're the one who picks out the things <laughs> that uh, we look for teams that we should look out for. That's, um, yeah, look, I think... I think we will see two fairly full-on teams at squads anyway. I think I think both of them will will definitely have an eye on the following week and they need to get minutes into those players, especially the international players returning. So, um, yeah, look, a lot has to go right for Munster to win and that's no disrespect to Munster. I just think that Leinster operate on a different level. Um, I thought they were... Okay, I know that Connor threw down to 14 players last weekend for a majority of the game, but I just thought they... Some of the rugby they played last weekend was just exceptional. Um, and I think the big thing for them is that um, their selections in terms of like players that they don't select will just be just as good as the internationals that are on the pitch more than likely. Whereas at Munster, I just think they're lacking that, that next little layer of depth. And I think that that's kind of probably where, not, not in every position, but in some positions, I think. So I think that that's kind of been where, where, where Munster's probably... Uh, development needs to improve um, but yeah I, I do think I think if Munster get to the pitch of this game mentally and have the courage to go and play then they can trouble Leinster and, and of course they can win but it'll be you know I'm not I'm not so unrealistic to think that look it's going to be incredibly difficult I just do think that um, you know you bring them down into a cauldron like Tom Park on a Saturday evening and and, and make it on as comfortable for them as possible. If you don't get the results, you're just putting yourself in good stead for the following week in terms of the intensity of the game. So, um, yeah, look, I just think it'll be interesting to see the selections. I think a lot will depend on that. Big things for Munster, for me, will be tight head who starts there, I think. Second row, um, that back row combinations, to be fair, I think, look, and I know Manny and Byrne and these ads are coming back, but... I've loved the balance of... Would you be tempted to put Ty Byrne in the back row if he's available now? He has a lower limb strain, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah put Ty be... Byrne, O'Mahony and Gavin Coombs and play oh, Sean Klein and ridiculous. Jason Jenkins in the in the second I row. think that's ridiculously harsh on the likes of uh, Jack O'Donoghue. Jack O'Donoghue. Exceptional John since Hodnett. Christmas. John Hodnett. And I really like the back, that balance of that back row with Jack O'Donoghue, Hodnett and Coombs or Candelan. Like, it, it, I... It's tough. And then you look at the nine, like Casey, Murray, uh, who goes in there. Just 
Does Carberry come in kind of cold, having played not a huge amount of rugby, whereas Ben Healy's playing very, very well, I think. Uh, I think the centre has picked themselves and, and that back three. So, yeah, look, I just think... Yeah, I think Keith Earls is, is unlikely to be available. I think he's back training this week. And Andrew Conway, unlikely to be available as well. I was just looking at the, the kind of report from yesterday, what was released by Munster Rugby, who was training, who was not. Mike Haley possibly out as well. So I think Munster are a bit under a bit of pressure in that that kind yeah. of back three. Uh, Tyburn, Carberry, Andrew Conway. They were all released back. Peter Armani, Connor Murray back with the back to the squad. Keith Earls has a tie injury. Thomas Ahern is still a tie in injury. Roman Selenau, back they back training this week. So they maybe may have a chance. Andrew Condor has been rehabilitating his leg. Um, I think the biggest issue for them is up front. I think they can fill in the back three players, but I think I think John Klein is important to him. Um, you need For to me, John Klein and, and, um, and Mike Haley will be two of the mainstays that if they're not there, you'd worry. Um, and not because of the lack of talent, but because they give you such security in both those positions. Um, but And then Simon Zebo as well, under a high ball, if he had to play full back, um, if Mike Haley is out, would you be putting Zebo or Matt Gallagher in full back? Who knows? I think there's... Um, you know, it is an incredibly difficult couple of weeks, but I think there's, um, I, we keep saying it, and every time it happens, it's a need for Munster to win this game. I think if they can turn that corner in their development, um, because look, you know, we keep, you know, Leinster are a very, very strong squad, very strong side. Um, they won't want to go down to Tolman Park and lose because they've um, incredibly high standard and they've they've shown that they can go there and win in the last couple of years and they've been pretty consistent in doing that i think the monster fans are craving for 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 a, for a monster win and i think the importance of this win you know we always say it's just league points people outside say it's just the league points or maybe the coaches say that but there's more to this game leave this monster lenser is different i always feel like you speak about this game like it's almost like a European Cup game, irrelevant if it's not in terms of the, it's, the intensity. It's nearly, of it. it's nearly bigger um, at times because um, back when I played, and I know things have changed and it's a lot of Team Ireland now, um, not all the fans on both sides would agree with that. They'd love the bit more bitterness involved in it. But look, it's probably better. Um, and it is the idea for, for provincial rugby is to try and make sure they do well with Ireland. But things ramp up this week at training because it's... They do, yeah. Today. It's a different week. It's a different week and nobody wants to lose this game and it's probably one of the biggest derby games in world rugby um, and that's that sounds like a big statement but it's not. Um, I think Munster Leinster is the biggest inter-pro. Um, it's, you know, you, you've seen the crowds that have been in the RDS, in Thomond Park, in, in Crow Park, in the Aviva over the years. People want to go to this fixture. There's an excitement about it. There's a different sort of intensity. Robin McBride, well, um, forwards coach, the scrum coach for, for Leinster, is speaking yesterday in the media about the intensity. This has to go up a, a number of notches. I think it's difficult on the players, and I've, I've covered this fixture so many times over the years. And usually you have a group of players coming back from international duty or, you know, and we expect them to be hit the ground running. They're not always the best games, but there's always a bite and an aggression and an intensity because players don't want to lose it. And that hasn't changed from when I was playing to now. Um, I just don't think they hate each other, maybe, or there's not, there's as much <laughs> kind of niggle, niggle um, consistently. Um, the rivalry is massive, you know, and it's good. It's good for it. It's part of sport, uh, but it is a different week. There's a nervous energy, Neve, and, and and both players will feel that. And, and you know, you win this week. Um, it propels you nicely into Europe and you can build momentum going forward with that. So Leinster can pick a completely different team this week from what they had in Connacht. You know, I was going through right now the team. It's it's phenomenal. Probably They probably will have... 12, 13 different players from the team that played against against um, and, and all inter and all internationals. All internationals. Monster probably six or seven coming back into this into the team. So maybe less disruption for them, but yeah. um still very, very strong players. You know, you think you could have a backline of Gibson Park, Sexton, Henshaw, Ring Rose, Low, Keenan. It's effectively the Irish backline. Jordan Larmer is out injured. Um, Jimmy O'Brien will probably play in the wing. 
But then the back row, Doris, Conan, Van der Fleer, phenomenal, you know, and um, that sometimes is the little bit of a difference. But Munster have got to, you know, find um, a game plan that challenges Leinster, as we said, and we've spoken about that. I think people will want to see that. And if they do that, then uh, maybe get a bit of luck. They possibly yeah. can do it, but it's a tall order and it's a tough one for them from this week. Um, so good luck to, to you. You're in uh, you're in France. You won't be there. I'll I'll be there on Saturday night. We've no other gossip or news. We're still waiting on the, the head coach announcements. Uh, my spies are telling me Thursday or Friday, possibly. Oh well. Unless you were here and at different down in Limerick, are you? No, I'm not. I tell you, I'm spending as much time in Dublin at the moment as you are. <laughs> so. Yeah, so uh, we'll be back next week anyway. We'll be uh, go through that Munster Leinster game and and obviously your game as well. So that's it for episode 25, the Red 7 8, 78. To make sure you get your podcast straight to your phone every week, just search the Red 78 and press subscribe. And don't forget to get in touch with your thoughts. You can either tweet Neve or myself directly or uh, tweet at at Rugby Channel 15 or search to um, YouTube and you can leave a comment there as well if you want. So as ever, thanks, Neve. Um, you're off to do some more media now to talk about your game at the weekend. I got an exclusive there that I got to you before any other media did. <laughs> well, good luck for the thanks, weekend. Thanks, Queenie. I know it's, uh, it's um, uh, on both fronts, it's uh, tough challenges. Munster yeah. versus Leinster and Ireland versus France in Toulouse. So good luck and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks a million. The Munster Rugby Podcast. Red 78 with Adam Quinlan and Neil Briggs. Nobody knows Munster Rugby better.